Okay, Fargo, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to have the opportunity to speak to Owen about this important subject. As a blow in, Fargo, it's, it's also a, a, a real privilege to be entrusted with the task of chairing this event on a night when we're honouring the memory of uh, the late Harry Holland. Um, so I hope I'll, I'll do him justice. Um, Owen, uh, first of all, thanks for giving up your Thursday evening, come up and speak to us. Um, Owen will be known to most people as the Sinn Féin TD for Dublin Midwest and the party spokesperson on housing, a position he's held since his election in 2016, which I think makes you the second longest serving Sinn Féin frontbencher after Pierce Loughery. Is that right? Could be right. Uh, it could be right. Uh, Owen is also the author of five books. I don't know where he finds the time. Uh, on a range of different subjects, including this book here, Home, which is an ex excellent comprehensive account of the history of housing, the systemic nature of the housing crisis and the solutions that Owen and his party are, are proposing. And this will form largely form the basis for tonight's discussion, but we'll maybe pick up on some of the other themes of, of your other books sure. uh, if, if we <clears> get a chance. Uh, before we delve into this, and I, I, I forewarned you about this, um, most people know a, a hell of a lot about you. You're one of the most prominent uh, Sinn Féin spokespersons uh, on, on the island. Uh, but could you start by just giving us a brief background to your political development, you know, where did you get your politics from? How did you make your way through Sinn Féin and the, the, the position you're in now? Yeah, Sean wants me to bore you all senseless at the very start of the talk. I um, say brief. <laughs> even in brief, it's pretty boring. Um, before I do that, can I say something about Harry Holland, first of all, because I do talks all over the country and I do talks on housing uh, uh, almost weekly. Um, and I can talk about housing until your eyes bleed, folks. So just be very, very careful. But I just want to acknowledge the fact, first of all, when I was invited to, to come and give this particular discussion, I, I, I was genuinely blown away, right? I know Sarah Holland very well for many years. Um, I, I didn't know Harry that well. Um, I used to have a, an office just around the corner from the fruit and veg shop. So I, I would have met him in there a few, a few times. Uh, and that's where I would have met the very formidable Holland sisters uh, at that time. Um, but it just strikes me, Fergal was showing me around, this place wouldn't exist without folks like Harry Holland, right? And for, for younger folks in the room, I, I just think that's really important to say at the start. I mean, Sarah and I spoke this morning and I was saying, look, I didn't know that much about your father. Tell me about what was the first thing that you said? That he spent huge amounts of time raising money for the local Quail Scullinan, right? To ensure that his daughters and the local community had proper Irish language education. And I think we take for granted maybe some of the incredible things that our communities have delivered in recent years. Um, but it is because of folks like Harry, and I don't say that because the family here, I think it's absolutely true, that compared to when I lived in Belfast from 95 to 2006, the, the extent to which our communities have built community-owned, community-run, community-directed infrastructure, whether it's Irish language, whether it's community, whether it's media is just remarkable. So I just, I just wanted to start by saying that. And it's also kind of fitting that we're going to have a discussion about housing, but it's really going to be a discussion about equality, right? Because ultimately, housing is a matter of, of equality or inequality. Uh, and certainly from knowing Sarah in particular, uh, I have no doubt that half of the reason why she has the politics she has is because of her father. The mother is the other half. But that core, whether it's communism, whether it's socialism, whether it's republicanism, that core belief in equality, social, economic, political, cultural, linguistic, I think is just, is really key. So I, I didn't want to let it pass without acknowledging Harry's contribution to those. <laughs> to answer the question really shortly, um, I grew up in kind of middle-class South County Dublin, not very much politics in the family I grew up in. Um, I was kind of interested in music and art left school at 18, moved to London, and it was really my experience of an Irish person in London that kind of got me connected into politics. Um, you, you need to think about kind of the early 90s in London, 
and the early 90s in Dublin, late 80s, early 90s, I could learn more about what was happening in Belfast in London than I could growing up in South County Dublin at the same time. Uh, part of that was because there was less direct censorship, there was less revisionism, but also there was far more focus in the North. And in fact, some of my early experiences of thinking about the conflict here was just working in the catering industry with folks from the Shankill, folks from the Falls, folks from other places. Uh, it was also during that period that I got very involved in trade union issues. The first politics I ever had was trade unionism in the catering industry. But really it was just kind of getting involved in Irish community activism that started to make me ask all sorts of questions. And from there, I suppose I took more interest in the conflict. And when my five years in London came to an end and I decided to move home, I took the unusual decision, certainly from somebody from my background, of not moving back to Dublin, but coming to Belfast. Um, joined Sinn Féin in 95 and have worked full time ever since. And that's the secret to my youthfulness. It's working for this crazy party of ours. Um, I lived in Belfast for 11 years. I was elected to Belfast City Council. I had a pile of other jobs during my period here. Um, moved home in 2006, stood in two elections in the neighbourhood I grew up in 2007 and 2009, came last, got less votes in the second election than in the first, which is quite an achievement. And then in 2010, I moved to the kind of suburbs of Dublin, a place called Clondalkin. Lived there since. We have built the Sinn Féin organisation in that constituency from pretty much non-existent to now where 40% of the uh, voters in Dublin Midwest uh, uh, vote for Sinn Féin. And it's not just that they vote for Sinn Féin, but there's also been a kind of a considerable shift in public attitudes on a whole range of issues. Um, I was elected to South Dublin County Council 2014, the Dáil 2016, the Dáil 2020. Um, and I am 30 years a Sinn Féin activist this year. Mm, That's the short version. Great. Uh <clears throat> you see, you were on the council in Belfast for between 2001 and 2005. And it was a really eventful period in the history of this part of the world. Uh, Good Friday Agreement wasn't long signed. You had the, the institution of, of the Assembly and the Executive, the suspension of the mm -hmm. Assembly and the Executive, um, tensions within re the broader Republican family, like what were your Biden memories of, of that period and what impression did it have on you? Yeah, you keep asking the long questions, not the short questions. <laughs> um, like there was a sense for, for those of us, <clears throat> and like I was just a, a kind of a regular activist working in the party at various levels. I'd worked at the press office in Sinn Féin Youth on the council. Um, there, there was really a sense, particularly during those years leading up to and after 98, that, that you were kind of witnessing history, but very, very close up. That stuff was happening that doesn't ordinarily happen in the ordinary course of things. That there were fundamental changes happening. And some of the outworking of those have taken much longer than we would have thought uh, at the time. Um, uh, abiding memories, there, there are just too many of them. Um, I have to say though, and when I moved back home in 2006, one of the things that often strikes me is up here during those years, and it's still the sense today, politics really matters, right? Politics is real, it's immediate, it's ingrained in everyday life, right? When I moved home, politics is kind of over there, right? And that's partly because politicians have wanted to keep it over there, and also just because of the way in which politics and, and life, politics and language, politics and culture, have over the history of the free state uh, separated. And for me, that's one of the really kind of abiding differences is even when I was in Belfast City Hall and um, Holy Cross was happening and we were having fierce rows on the floor, everybody that was in that room, politics mattered, right? In many cases, at times it was life or death. Uh, and that's why like, I really like coming up and doing these kinds of events because an event like this, rooted in a community like this, doesn't happen very often in Dublin. Yes, you'll get city centre events with lots of very kind of ideologically orientated political activists, right? But these kinds of events which happen all over the north and in some parts of the south are not as common as they could or should be. So for me, it's not that I remember one event, it's just that sense that the interconnection between politics and everyday life, mm. I think is much more real and tangible here. And mm. I think that's a really good thing uh, and it shouldn't be lost. Mm. Well, so Kevin was just saying there before we come on here that he, he's in from Belfast himself, he's been in Dublin 30 years and he, that's the one thing he noticed when he comes back home, is that politics is 
intertwined with everyday life, everyday conversations. Um, so you left Belfast, went back to Dublin, worked for the party in different capacities. Yeah. You were eventually elected after a few attempts, 2013, then 2016. Did you work for Threshold, the housing charity, for a period? I worked for Focus Ireland. Focus. <clears throat> I did, yeah. Yeah. Is that, was that sort of a natural segue then into the housing sort of portfolio whenever you took it uh, within the party? No, was, was that just a coincidence? Complete accident. <laughs> um, like I'd, I'd been working full time for the party from 95 through to 2007. Um, and during a very intense period of the party's history and the community's history. So I just took a decision to take a few years out and, and get a normal job, um, as I thought. And I, just, I was just very lucky, a job became available. But like there's a, a small interesting story about that. So this job became available for this very reputable housing charity. <coughs> homelessness charity set up by Sister Stanislaus Kennedy um, in the 1970s. And it's one of the primary providers of homeless services to families with children. And Sister Stan is one of those remarkable characters that the Catholic Church throws up every so often, who became a really strong advocate for social justice, for equality, anti-poverty, even when those things would have made her superiors very yeah. uncomfortable. But actually when I applied for the job, they really didn't want to hire me, right? I was like, I was super qualified. I had university qualifications. I'd worked in housing for years. I'd done all sorts of things. <clears throat> and at the time, I didn't believe it. But eventually afterwards, I was eventually hired after two job interviews. I found out that they were so nervous about employing a shinner who just moved south from the north in what was a relatively mid-level advocacy job that they actually had to bring the, the job offer to the board for board approval, right? Yes. Which, which just isn't the way job applications ordinarily happen. And I see Mary Query there. Mary will know this from her long years of interaction with the women's movement and the LGBT movements north and south. When I moved south, even at that point in 2006, seven and eight, and it wasn't even being a member of Sinn Féin, but being somebody from the north, albeit born in the south, and being politically active, the amount of barriers that were in your way were just remarkable. And that's all transformed. Like it's really, really changed. But that was a, a, a quite a big thing for me to think, despite the fact that I met all the qualifications, all the criteria. In fact, the only reason I applied for the job is I couldn't get anybody else to do it because nobody would work for the wages they were offering because they weren't as, as well paid as private sector jobs. I didn't care about the money. Um, but that at that time, it was just difficult to get a job if you were a shinner. Mm -hmm. um, but I got the job and they didn't sack me. So that all worked out okay. As you say, that's changed now. So uh, the political environment's really <coughs> transformed. Um, so you, you've, in your current position as Sinn Féin TD, party spokesperson, you've spent the best part of a de decade immersed in housing, researching it, writing about it, critiquing the government, holding them to account, and developing your own proposals um, for an alternative system. Hmm. Uh, so just to start off with, could you give us, in the broadest terms, your diagnosis of what's wrong with the housing system as it's currently constructed and what it's the causes of those <clears throat> problems are? Sure, and I suppose just to say, like when I joined Sinn Féin and I was living in North Belfast, housing was the number, number one political issue, right? More than anything else, uh, uh, you know, other than periodic bouts of UDA pipe bombing or housing was simply the biggest issue that we were faced with. Uh, and that's the same today, right? I'm, I'm, I'm without doubt, uh, housing has always been, whether it's before the civil rights movement, after the civil rights movement, right into the 90s and noughties here in West Belfast, housing was, you know, one of, if not the biggest issues. So in some senses, without realising it, I've been a housing activist as long as I've been a political activist. Um, and therefore, a lot of the stuff that I, I talk about, specifically in the southern context, it's learnt on the New Lodge. It's learnt here in West Belfast. It's learnt in the City Hall. D to put it really succinctly, We've had a problem for three decades. We've all had it, right? It's a problem here, South, Britain, you know, all over the overdeveloped world, where successive governments have wrongly taken the view that the private sector can meet the overwhelming majority of housing needs in society. Right? And the problem is that's just not empirically accurate. It's just not true, right? It's not a political point of view. It's not an ideological point of view. Uh, the nature of housing, just how much it costs to deliver really good quality homes for people, is such that the private market, private investors, private developers, private landlords, 
cannot in any society anywhere in the world meet the housing needs of the overwhelming majority of the population. And since the 1990s and the 19, end of the 80s and early 1990s is a turning point everywhere. At the point at which the states start to withdraw from large scale delivery of good quality public homes, housing needs of various kinds have exponentially increased. In the South, we have a particularly acute problem because the housing crisis is probably far more acute by almost all indicators than most comparable European cap capitals and, and even uh, 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 secondary cities like Belfast or others uh, in terms of population size. But the core problem is that idea that if you want a society where access to good quality homes is based on principles of need, based on principles of equality, then the state has to play a phenomenally larger role than it has been allowed to play over the last three or more decades. And that's, that's kind of the answer, folks. And I, I don't want to simplify it because all of these issues are complex and uh, 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 there aren't easy solutions. But the, the subtitle to the book is very deliberate. Public housing is the answer. And we can have lots of discussions around what, what do we mean by public housing, who gets access to it, how is it delivered, who delivers it, how is it funded. But unless our housing system has a really, really large portion of what we call non-market homes, homes that are delivered to meet need, not to generate profit, then our housing systems are always going to be incredibly unequal. And the irony is today, the south of this country is richer than we have ever been. We have more resources in terms of budget surpluses, access to low cost capital. We have more skills, we have more experience, we have more. And the scale of housing need of people being unable to access secure, appropriate, and affordable accommodation is greater than at any other time since the Second World War. And I say that, again, as an empirical fact. So it's that idea that an over-reliance on the private sector to do everything has led to escalating levels of uh, unequal access to housing. And therefore, the obvious solution then is to start reasserting the role of the state, not in some nostalgic way, because right? the past was never perfect either, but for the state, central government, regional government, local government, uh, alongside communities. Uh, to become much more active in delivering large volumes of non-market public housing is really where the conversation, thankfully, now is at. Mm. So there's there's a strong possibility. We're talking outside. There's an election likely to be called next November in the South. There's a strong possibility, the way the numbers are looking, um, that you may be the next housing minister. Um, so if given that opportunity, what would you and your party do differently? What are the first things that you would do with that, mm. with that mandate? So, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, just to say, nothing is inevitable in politics. Mm. Um, we all go into every election thinking we're going to do well, and half the elections I've thought we've done much, much worse than yeah. we thought. So you, you never know, right? But things are obviously looking very positive at the minute. Uh, let me come at the question in another way, right? Because I, I actually think this is part of the problem with our conversation. The first thing you have to ask is, where do you want your housing system to be, right? Because if you don't have a vision, if you don't have a sense of what this system needs to look like, then you've no end point against which to start saying, okay, so what are the steps on your road to get there, right? So the first thing is, and this is one of the big differences a Sinn Féin-led government would have in housing, is we'll actually tell people what we want the housing system to look like. So at the moment, 10% of our housing system is non-market housing, public housing of various kinds. 20% is a private rental sector. And then the remaining 70%, 69% are people with mortgages. Half of them have paid those out, half of them are paying them down, right? We need a housing system that has, at a minimum, 30% of all homes to be public non-market housing, right? Never in the history of the state did we have that. We almost reached 20% at one time. So that gives you a sense of the scale of the shift that you need to make. It also means that our private rental sector has to be smaller. Private rental sectors are okay if they're properly regulated and properly managed. But they meet the needs of a very specific group of people. And at the moment, probably two thirds of the people who live in our private rental sector don't want to be there, shouldn't be there, should be in some other form of tenure. Um, and then in terms of owner occupation, owner occupation has a place, right? But in real terms, if we have a non-market housing sector of 30%, a private rental sector, albeit fundamentally different than when we have a 10%, then actually our traditional privately owned owner occupying sector it's actually about 60%. So that's the, the first thing. The second thing then is, to get to that, you have to have a level of state investment, 
and a level of ambition in terms of the delivery of new homes, again, at a level that we've never seen in the history of the state. And there were some periods in the state, as well as in the period of the North, particularly in the housing executive, where there was very, very significant investment in public housing. Uh, but for example, last year, government would have built and bought maybe seven and a half thousand new social homes in the South, about a thousand affordable homes, and they're not always that affordable. We need about 25,000 public homes, non-market homes, every year for a decade. Right? And that's just to start undoing the undersupply of those kind of homes over the last 30 years. Uh, and you'll notice I'm using the word public housing because I also think we need to have a conversation around what do we mean by non-market housing? Because there are people in society, either throughout their entire lives or at certain points in time, they can't afford the full economic cost of housing. It's just not possible. Right? They're never going to be able to do it. And that's what we talk about social housing. It's housing that will always have a level of subsidy. But there's a whole bunch of other people out there who don't need a subsidy. They just need to be able to access housing at the cost of producing it without the land speculation, without the developer's margin, without the high cost of finance. And therefore, for me, public housing isn't housing for poor people, right, in the way that neoliberal governments have made it since the 1990s. Public housing is housing for people. It's housing for a very, very broad range of no income, low income, modest income, good income, right? And of course, during our lives, lots of us move between all of those different groups. So it's almost like rethinking what we mean by public housing. Who is it for? How is it designed? How is it built? And therefore, it's not just the system and the volume, it's also the thing itself. And then there's a couple of other big cha challenges. Um, we're still gonna have private housing folks, right? The private market isn't disappearing. So there's a big challenge for the left. It doesn't matter how you describe yourselves. Even if you had the biggest public housing building program in the history of the state, even if we were delivering 25,000 non-market homes to meet social and affordable uh, housing needs on an annual basis, the private sector still exists. And therefore, what is the role of the state, of a progressive left Republican government, in terms of completely changing the way you regulate how the private market operates in terms of land acquisition, planning, development, uh, and pricing. Uh, and then, I suppose the final bit of it is, if we need, as most experts reckon in the South, 50,000 new homes a year, half of those would have to be non-market, they'd have to be market homes. You can't keep building homes of brick and concrete and steel and address climate change, right? In fact, the fourth largest contributor to our emissions is what we call the embodied carbon in the built environment. Yes, we know about agriculture. Yes, we know about transport. Yes, we know about energy efficiency. And as those start to reduce, if we're building 50,000 public and private homes a year and all of the infrastructure and schools and community centers and roads, unless we fundamentally change the way in which we build, the materials we use, how we reuse existing and vacant stock, we're not gonna be able to meet the uh, 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 very important emissions reductions targets. So it's also about changing the way in which we go about planning, building, uh, uh, um, uh, the homes that people live in. So, again, I'm only scratching the surface of it, but there's a profound difference between where we want to go, what we need to do to get there, and how we would go about getting there uh, to uh, any of the other larger parties in the Oireachtas at present. Mm. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll make come back to the, the importance and significance of mixed income housing <coughs> in a moment, uh, and maybe also the private sector involvement as a communist. Uh, but yeah, yeah. but uh, the, the issue, the, the, there's a lot of talk about affordability, yeah. affordable housing. The government uses this term on a, on a regular basis, but we know it doesn't mean affordable in the sense that we understand it. So I, I know that within your overarching proposals for a public housing model, affordability is a key thing yeah. that you try to address. Could you maybe go into a bit more detail about what that looks like? Yeah, so let's start with what affordability isn't. Affordability isn't a discount on market price, right? And one of the most frustrating things about the government of London and the government of Dublin is when they talk about affordable housing, whether it's to rent or buy, they conceptualize it as the market charges this, and therefore we're saying affordability is this minus a discount, minus 20%, 25% or whatever else. That's not affordable, right? In fact, it has no meaning whatsoever. So what do we mean by affordable? Okay, so as a society, we have to decide what is for folks on average and above average incomes, what is the acceptable level of housing costs? Right? We have to find a metric to say, it is reasonable for people to pay up to this point and no more 
of the net disposable income on housing, whether they're paying a mortgage, whether they're renting or whatever else. This is you know, on, on, on the round. Internationally, people kind of talk about a third, 33%, 30% or so, right? Although it's a kind of an arbitrary figure. <clears throat> the Economic um, uh, uh, Social Research Institute in the South, they have a really interesting definition, which is a third of your disposable income, but so long as that leaves you with enough income in an average week to afford an average set of, of, of goods in terms of services and, and other things. For me, of course, the problem is averages, as, as the economists in the room will know, they, they miss some of the detail because we're, none of us are averages. And therefore, for me, I think when I talk about affordable housing, it really has to mean no more than 29% of the take-home pay of somebody on above average incomes. And then for folks below that, particularly for lower incomes, it has to be set significantly lower. One of the big differences between our social housing system in the South and here is following the 1930s, council rents were determined as a percentage of household income, right? So it's a system called differential rent. If you rent from the local authority in, in South Dublin County Council, where I live, your council rent is 10% of the household's disposable income plus a euro, give or take. Some local authorities go up as far as 15%, incredibly affordable. And therefore, in an ideal world, you wouldn't just have those two. You wouldn't just have your 10 to 15 and your 29. You'd have something a little bit more varied. But it's that idea that, first of all, affordability is determined by income of people's ability to pay for whatever it is that they are. And then the second thing is, affordable housing cannot be market housing, right? It cannot be delivered for profit. Because once you then introduce that element of profit, whether it's limited profit in terms of what they call affordable cost rental in, in the government scheme of the South, or just regular profit, that just then pushes up the price. So for me, it's first of all about just defining what's the appropriate or maximum level of take home pay people can pay on their housing costs. Um, and then beyond that, it's also about saying, but affordable housing is always non-market housing. It's always housing that in the first instance is designed to meet a housing need rather than the first instance to deliver a, a, a profit for the investor or developer or whoever. Mm. And w within your proposals around affordable housing, you have two different strands to that. So there's affordable rental yep. from whether it's local authorities or, or the the state and and this is where your your plan or your proposal sort of differs from the proposals that might be put forward by other advocates of universal public housing for example like say Ergi and, and, and other groups yeah. uh, a provision for ownership yeah. private ownership within a public housing model so yeah. how does that work sure. what does it look like so the, I mean the first thing is See when a politician tells you what kind of house you should live in, then don't vote for that politician. See when a housing campaigner tells you what kind of house you should live in, right? Or what kind of tenure. Who, who are they to tell you whether you should live in this or that, right? It, for me, it's one of the fundamental principles, like when you hear politicians get up and say, we're the party of home ownership, everybody should own their own home. Or somebody on the other side saying, nobody should own anything and everybody should be a renter. I'm sorry, folks, it's not the job of politicians to tell people what tenures they should live in, right? The state should be tenure neutral. The state should not be in the business of instructing people to live in one tenure or another. Uh, for me, that's a fundamental principle. And right now in our society, we have a group of people who cannot and may never be able to afford the full economic cost without profit of their housing needs. And we have to have a form of tenure for them, and that's what we call social housing. There's another bunch of people who need no subsidy. And right now, they don't want to own anything. They want to rent, right? And we have to be able to provide for those people what we call full cost recovery affordable rental. Right? No profit in it, no excess. They're just paying the economic cost. But there's also a whole bunch of people who want to own. Right? And home ownership, contrary to what my communist friends say, has lots of benefits. And it particularly has benefits from an estate management uh, uh, point of view. Because one of the values of home ownership, even in the social housing stock, and we can talk about the complications of that, is that it allows families to, in, to ensure what we call intergenerational security of tenure. If I go, for example, to the, the best social housing estates in my constituency, and we have a lot of them. What's really interesting about them is they were built in the 60s, 70s, or 80s. At least half of the people who still live there today are related to the people who got the original allocations. They could have inherited the tenancy as council tenants, or they could have inherited the property through the passing on of the property uh, through intergenerational home ownership. And what that does is it creates real stability in communities. It creates a real sense of cohesion. It doesn't exclude other people because there's also a churn, right? So the problem is, Almost every affordable housing scheme that I've ever come across, 
in the south or Britain or whatever else, is affordable only to the first purchaser. Because what the state does is the state takes public land, the state brings in building contractors, builds the house, and then sells it to you either at some kind of discount or shared ownership scheme or, or whatever else, right? And usually in that scheme, there's a provision that if you try and sell the house with a particular period of time, there's some clawback or return to the state or whatever. But at the moment that house is sold, it ceases to be an affordable home and it becomes a private home, right? Mm -hmm. That makes no sense. It makes no sense to anybody. So the model we have for affordable home ownership is as follows. We build a housing estate, right? That housing estate has social rental and affordable rental fully mixed and integrated. Nobody knows the difference, right? Because you want that income mix. But it also has the option for you to buy the house. What we don't do is sell you the land. The land remains public in perpetuity, full stop. And we give you free indefinite use of that land <clears throat> subject to a number of legally binding covenants. One of those is that property can never be rented out. It's for you, your children, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren as a family home. The second is that house can never be sold into the private market. And the idea would be that if you want to sell and you bought the bricks and mortar, that the physical structure of the house is yours, the land is ours, right? We pay for the land and the site servicing, whatever else. At the point at which you want to sell, you then sell to another affordable purchaser who meets the affordable purchasing criteria by income or whatever else um, at the future affordable purchase price, which is the price you paid for it index linked to inflation and home improvements. What does that do? Well, the first thing it does is separate to the private market, which is governed by market forces. We generate year after year after year, and we'd like to do four or 5,000 of these units a year, is a growing number of privately owned, privately traded, but permanently affordable homes, fully integrated into your public housing stock with social uh, rental and affordable rental. Now, you might say, well, why, why do you do that? Why don't you just rent them out? Right now, folks, people want to buy the house. People want to own the home. People feel that because of their experience of rental over very long periods of time, uh, it's too insecure. And therefore, I think at this point in time, we should give people the option to purchase. And you may then find that at some point people go, well, why would I bother buy when I can rent? But I don't think we're at that point yet. And I don't think it's the responsibility or the, the role of the state to direct people into one or the other. So in that sense, it's a completely different form of thinking about uh, 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 home ownership. And what's also really important is one of the most speculative elements of the all in delivery cost of housing is land, speculation in land. So essentially what we're doing is we're just taking land out of the equation. Land is no longer to be speculated on. It's public land, it's a public asset, and the public good in return is affordable home ownership. Um, and we think on that basis, average price of a start at home, myself and Kevin were talking about this on the way in the car today, out in Lucan, suburbs of Dublin, right? Average price of a start at home, 400,000 euros, right? What's the cost of building that home, the bricks and mortar? 200,000 euros. Everything else is land, taxes, compliance, site servicing, developers, uh, margins and all the rest. So the state on public land in a fully integrated public housing mixed income model could be allowing people to buy their own homes for themselves and their children, their grandchildren for half the price that the private market is currently providing. So I know it's a bit of a long explanation, but that's the, the logic of the proposition. Your answer was so comprehensive. You sort of covered the things I was going to come back at you. <laughs> The, 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 the argument I would have made is, that, right, okay, so you can't, you can't sell the house in the private market, so yeah. you can't profit from it. Yeah. Presumably you can't rent it out, so yeah. you can't sweat it as Perfect. an asset. That's it. Right? Long-term intergenerational security of tenure could be delivered through the public system. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is some people would argue, and I think you've argued this yourself, is that there's no innate desire, there's no innate, there's no home ownership gene within the Irish population. That's something that's been cultivated, fostered and deliberately foisted upon people over the years by the state. So in your view, is it desirable to try to undo that over the long term through the type of public housing system that you're advocating? Or is that just too much of a long shot? I just think it's the wrong question. Um, what do people want? People want security. People want affordability. People want good quality homes. That's what people, people want, right? The reason why home ownership, particularly in Southern society, is so valued is A, 
it was always the most secure form of tenancy. Even when people got their council houses, they weren't guaranteed their kids could inherit them. So tenant purchase, as it's called in the South, uh, uh, when you buy your council house, guaranteed them that. So it's not that people wanted to possess something. It's that it gave them the security and the stability. But also, let's be honest about this, right? Let, let's not imagine that there's, there's this nirvana of public rental, right? I spend an awful lot of time in council houses talking to council tenants, right? Who have a very, very long list of complaints about why their social landlord isn't the landlord that they want. And many of those people don't want to have a relationship with a the landlord. They don't want to have to go and ask permission when they want to paint the walls. They don't want to go and ask for permission when they want to do home renovations, right? So for me, I don't care if people are rent or own. I, for me, that's not a political point, right? For me, what's important is how come the state ensure that all of those people who, for whom the market cannot meet their housing needs can have their housing needs met by the state. And right now, there's a whole bunch of those people who want to buy the house, right? And sure, you and I can go to them, and we can bring the Communist Manifesto with us, and we can extol the virtues of public ownership of all assets and no private property, sure. They still want to buy the house, folks, right? And we rock up to them, and they're like, okay, Sean and Owen, you're two smart guys, and that's all very, very well, but you might not always be here. Right? Governments come, governments go, systems change. Right? Whereas having that security is so valuable to people. And then the other thing, of course, is because if you own a home at a point in your, your working life, you've paid it out. And you no longer have to pay anything for your home. And in a system such as the South, that has very, very poor pension provision, as you know, 50% of uh, 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 private sector workers have no pension, public pensions are very low. Often for people, having a home which you own and at a certain point in time you don't have to pay anything for in terms of rent is also a kind of a contribution to your pension. I wouldn't I design the system that way, but that's the way the system is. So I just think, let's not be hung up on whether people own the bricks and mortar or rent the bricks and mortar. <clears throat> let's be focused on affordability, adequacy, because in this nice conversation about all of these other things, we have to talk about whether the homes themselves are adequate, right? Because far too much public housing in many parts of the world didn't meet and continues not to meet the needs of very specific groups of people. Um, uh, 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 and security. For me, I think they're the values. And I think right now, we live in a capitalist economy. We live in an economy where a portion of people want to buy. And therefore, I think public housing can find a way of accommodating that without allowing people ever to get the windfall profits or to be able to sweat the ass in the way you do. And that's by retaining public ownership of the land and providing free and definite use of it under legally binding covenants. Okay. Do you understand why I had to answer the question? Mm, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nothing wrong with that. There's something you, you've touched on, um, and I said we'll come back to it, is sort of the stigma around social housing and how it was designed You know, in the South, as in many other places social housing access was restricted largely to the people in the lowest of incomes um, and that created all sorts of yeah. problems, concentrations of poverty, the problems associated with that, you know, yeah. the, the stigma, stigma that was built up around social housing, disinvestment on, on the part of the state, yeah. um, creating ghettos, actively creating ghettos. Uh, we've, we've talked a bit about community and, and the role, uh, the importance of, of building community and building strong communities. What, what's the link between mixed income, uh, social housing, and the building of thriving mm. and sustainable communities? So a couple of things. So for example, or not for example, but, but again, just to go back to language, there's no stigma around social housing, right? With, with, with the exception of one or two estates or pockets of estates, anywhere in this country, north or south, when a social home becomes available, there will be queues around the block for people who want to move in, right? So actually, for the vast majority of people who are trying to get access to social housing, there's no stigma about it, right? And we shouldn't, there, there is a, a patronizing view mm. projected towards social housing by other groups of people, right? And that's for sure. Uh, uh, but again, I represent, and, and Sarah knows when, when she was elected out in Tallaght, like we represent some of the largest social housing communities in the country outside of Dublin City. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, folks, they're really good places to live. They're vibrant places to live. They're not ghettos. And I know you weren't using the word in that way. Mm. But I think we have to really be careful of our language here because there's this kind of perception 
and it's filtered into mainstream politics and mainstream media. I was reading Matt Cooper's new book there recently, it's not out yet, and he again he uses some of that language. All of the empirical studies that are based on actual interviews with people who actually live in public housing estates, the overwhelming majority of those people in those estates say, these are great places to live. Doesn't mean they don't complain about the council not maintaining the stock properly. Doesn't mean they don't complain about lack of investment in jobs or community facilities. So first of all, we have to start talking really positively about these communities because they are really good places to live, right? Um, uh, 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 and they have a strength and a resilience that I think that's really important. To answer your question, in the main, when public housing first started to emerge, particularly both before and after the Second World War, public housing was generally just housing for working people. Right? It wasn't housing for poor people, whatever that word means. It was just housing for workers, right? Because the private sector, I mean, if you go back to the early 20th century, almost all in Europe, there wasn't really a large market of mid-priced private housing for people to buy. You either rented off a private landlord in usually very poor conditions, or you were uber wealthy, right? Um, and therefore, most public housing, as it moved throughout the 20th century, was just housing for working people. And that meant low-paid workers, modestly paid workers, well-paid workers, skilled workers, etc. And that was the same, certainly in the South, um, uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. What changed in the late 80s and early 90s is the state decided, universally across the overdeveloped world, to walk away from the large-scale provision of housing for regular working people. And they, instead, what they decided to do was the state's responsibility was just to provide a safety net for the very poor. They call it the residualization of public housing. And that then meant that uh, um, increasingly social housing was small-scale, infill bits of developments or small clusters of units. It was generally for people who had very, very low incomes or very complex needs of various kinds. And then progressively over periods of time, you got concentrations of, of really good people, but with all sorts of challenges in their life that needed certain kinds of interventions. And at the same time, because the state couldn't build enough of that housing for people, they did, for example, in the South, one of the most stupid things the government has ever done in housing, they paid higher income working class people free money to leave their council houses so they could be occupied by other folks uh, who had very complex needs. It was called a surrender grant. And all of a sudden, estates, I mean, you can think of parts of Jobstown, for example, right? Jobstown is in Tala. It can be a pretty tough place to be, right? Jobstown used to have a much more diverse income mix of working people. The Southern government gave those households, we'll give you five grand for nothing. That's for you to go and buy a private home to stimulate private house building. And who do they then replace into all of those homes? A very, very specific group of people with very specific needs. And as a consequence of those kinds of decisions, certain estates like Jobstown and we have a few others ended up having huge challenges without the resources and support for the folks that are there. So what that tells us is income mix is really important. Um, for, for those of you that are involved in housing, you'll often say, hear people say, Oh, it's really important to have mixed tenure, right? It really isn't. Tenure isn't, it can be monotenure, it can be mixed tenure. What really matters is mixed income uh, and good quality mixed income estates for very large cohorts of working people uh, uh, or people out of work or tempor temporarily out of work. One, because it just creates a much more stable social economic environment for the community. Two, it actually just makes the economic stability in terms of shops and services and, and other things much more, more viable. Um, and it also means, because if people's rents are related to their incomes, then the rents that are being generated are more likely to be able to cover the maintenance of the stock. One of the problems, again, in the South, rents only cover about 50% of the day-to-day -day cost of maintaining the units, right? And that's before you start thinking about boiler upgrades every 10 years and you know changing heating systems because of climate change. So if the people who live in these buildings have very, very low rents because their incomes are very, very low, then your social landlord, whether it's the local authority or whoever else, doesn't necessarily have a self-regenerating income stream to try and maintain the stock. So there's all sorts of reasons why you want mixed income housing. Um, and also mixed income housing works. Like it's, if I go and look at the best public housing estates in my constituency, they're the ones that have a nice amount of tenant purchase, intergenerational, mixed income, better community services and employment opportunities. And therefore, I think what we need to do is not design something new, look at what worked really well, look at what works really well today, and in our new housing estates, build in all of those kind of principles from the start. Mm. It, it takes me back to, it's a, the old motto that Grown and Mona lived by in, in many respects. It takes a village to raise a, raise a challenge, so you can picture a mixed income 
mm. social housing estate with a doctor, the G local GP lives there, the school principal, the the coach of the football team, you know, you name it, and they're working together mm. and they're creating that real bond, the solidarity and community spirit, like, so you can see it, you can see it working. Um, is, are there any models that you could point to uh, elsewhere with that, you know, that's still the case? Well, first of all, we don't have to, I mean, like, I think it's one of the problems that we often have in our housing debates is we always have to think, we do everything so badly here, we have to go abroad to find a better mm -hmm. way of doing it, right? There are lots of examples in our own history, North and South, where really, really good quality public housing was delivered to really good mixed income communities, and they exist and they survive and they're there today. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I urge people to do is go and look at the stuff that's there, right? Um, but also, I think it's often better to learn from the mistakes and say, okay, so what didn't work, right? Okay, well, certain types of housing in certain types of uh, periods, uh, or the surrender grant, for example, uh, particularly in places like Jobstown, didn't work. So let's not repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, but sure, like, <clears throat> I mean, one of the interesting things about the housing system in, in the south of Ireland is a lot of the European public housing actually emerged from the trade union movements, particularly in big countries like Germany and, and Austria. Because, of course, the German trade union movements also often ran the pension systems for those workers. They had pension income that they wanted to invest. Their workers needed housing. So, of course, it made complete sense for those pension funds to invest in housing for workers and to rent it back to those workers affordably. And, of course, it was a lovely virtuous circle because the rents that those workers paid were then paying for the, 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 the future servicing of their pensions. Makes eminent sense. But what a lot of those housing systems were really bad at is, is housing the very poor, right? Um, whereas, actually, in the South, because they introduced that differential rent, rent basically as a percentage of your household income, the southern public housing system in the 40s, 50s, 60s and 70s was always much better at ensuring that the very, very poor weren't left outside the housing system. So I think it's a mixture of those two types of things. And like we're doing a lot of meetings at the moment with the credit union movement and with the public sector trade unions, guards, teachers, nurses um, um, and uh, healthcare workers. And like they have working people. They have huge credit unions right, with huge investment capital. Those workers need homes to rent or buy, right? Those credit unions cannot just invest to build homes for people to rent or buy. They can also provide mortgages to their trade union members to rent or buy those houses. And then every single cent of, of revenue that's generated from that circular movement of money stays within the credit union uh, 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 and the dividends that that pays to its members and its services. So if you wanted the best example of how to apply the principles of community wealth building and the social economy to public housing, there's a nice model already. And guess what? We used to do that. We did it in the 30s. We did it in the 40s. Right? These aren't new concepts. So it's almost about relearning the stuff that we've been forced to forget mm. um, and just not repeating the mistakes of the past. And sure, we talk about Vienna and affordable cost rental in Vienna. We had affordable cost rental in Merino in 1922, thanks to coming and Ale. Right? You don't have to go to Red Vienna to have good quality public housing. The difference is Red Vienna just built loads and loads of it. Right? Mm. And they got that bit right. Um, so sure, there's some really interesting things happening in London at the minute, Finland, particularly on homelessness, really wonderful projects in parts of Spain. Is anywhere doing it perfect? No. Is some of those examples, examples that we can take here and apply north and south? Absolutely. But also, forget, don't forget, there was really important public housing projects built by the housing executive, right? Mm -hmm. Like I lived in, what was then Artillery House, Gronia House, right? And when they cleaned it up and put the concierge and I wouldn't have lived anywhere else. I lived on the 13th floor with spectacular views of Cave Hill and Belfast Lock and had the lowest rent you could imagine. And a lot of the housing executive stock, particularly in the 70s and 80s, was really good quality, right? And therefore, you know, let's remember the stuff we've done well before and just do more of it. Mm. I think that was a good time to...